Hey everyone, welcome to our podcast, Over the Hill. We're joined Jason and we're amateur cyclists on our quest to become the best version of ourselves while riding our bike. We also have a YouTube channel called Join Jason Rides, which is a visual recap of our races and events. Sometimes we can't really go in depth with our experiences in our videos, so hopefully this podcast can fill the gap. In this episode, I will share my experiences working with a sports nutritionist. We will also discuss how we fuel our endurance rides and rides with intensity, a few clarifications about last week's episode, and hot takes on the Women's Tour de France. Also, a storm was brewing during this episode and we had our windows open, so we apologize ahead of time for the ambient sound of rain in the background. And of course, Rudy's at it again. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Hey everyone. We are picking up where, for this podcast, we're picking up where we left off with the last one, which is the topic of nutrition. And there's a fair bit of information that we wanted to talk about with this one, so um, couldn't really fit it into the last podcast. Um, yeah, this today is, uh, I don't know if, hopefully you can't hear this in the background, but it's kind of pouring rain outside and we have the windows open because it's uh aside from the rain it's you know nice and cool weather so got the windows open but you might you might hear a little bit of rain in the background hopefully you don't hear our dog rudy in the background because he tends to decide to start playing with his toys when we're recording a podcast um but or growling at the moment yeah or <laughs> He's pretty much quiet all day until we need him to be quiet, and then he starts making noise. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into the topic of nutrition and um, nutrition and sports nutrition. Joy has been working with a nutritionist for how long now? I'm going to say about a month and a half. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it seems like longer than that to me. Yeah. Maybe it's a little bit more than that. I lost, I lost track of, of time. I don't remember exactly the day that I started with the program. Okay. So before we get into the specifics of the program, what made you decide to go down the route of seeking the help of a, of a sports nutritionist? So in the past, I struggled with my, I don't want to say that I struggled with my weight and it's always, uh, it's a kind of a touchy subject for some people. And I used to do like yo-yo dieting, um, where I tried the whole intermittent fasting um, for some time. And I tried just eating really well, which it's still a good thing to eat well, but I always struggled with why I was, I was still hungry. You know, I, I ate really well and, or with intermittent fasting, you know, I had, I followed that 16, eight rule and I still struggled with being hungry and I couldn't really quite figure out like what the formula was and it could be a number of things you know it could be hormonal it could just it could be stress um, it could be that I am not eating enough which is mostly the case but I was never sure if I was eating enough because you know when I check my weight on the scale, it really wouldn't budge. And so just for reference, I'm not really super, I'm not super light. Um, I was at one point a little over 150 pounds years ago. And this was, this was actually when during the pandemic, when Jason and I had this <laughs> bout of once a week, we would go grocery shopping at 
Stu Leonard's, which is a grocery store right down the road from us. And we would treat ourselves with soft served ice cream because we love their soft serve ice cream. And it's like a small cup, but it was like something that we just enjoy doing. And then, of course, I gained weight from that. And I think that's when I reached around 150 pounds. And I was I, I was riding then, but I wasn't riding as much as I do now. And I was you know, taken aback by that. And so I definitely had to do something about it. And so now I'm back down to a, I call it my healthier weight, which is the weight that I am comfortable with where I can do workouts. I'm not starving myself. I'm hitting my power targets. And I'm also, I feel mentally... I don't want to say energized. I don't feel drained um, is what I guess I'm trying to say. And so I'm about like hovering around 142 uh, at 5'5". Five five. So I'm not super light. And that's always, I think it's going to be the case for me. And would I like to get a little lower than that? Yeah, I could lose a little bit of body fat. But I'm not 100% sure if if that's if weight loss is really something that I want to pursue. So is it fair to say that with this nutrition plan that you've started or just the whole idea of, um, you know, working with a nutritionist is the goal kind of to to find something that's sustainable. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, so that you're not yo-yoing and um, find something that you can, that works and you can, that's healthy, uh, keeps you at a healthy weight that you're, that makes you feel good and just uh, continue with that indefinitely rather than kind of the ups and downs. Yeah, uh, definitely a sustainable approach to um, nutrition is what I was looking for. I wasn't, you know, I'm, I, I could, again, would like to lose a little bit of weight, but that's not really my number one priority at the moment because I have tried in the past cutting calories and it only was a detriment to my performance. And I heard or read somewhere that you can't really cut calories and see performance gains at the same time. You either cut calories or you just focus on performance gains. So I've come to a realization that that is really what I'm looking to do, but also manage my weight. Uh, yeah, I think that nutrition and dieting is, um, it's a tough subject because you can go too far with it either way. Um, it's, it's obviously possible to eat too much and and gain too much weight and be at a, a weight that's not ideal for um, for performance in your sport or just, you know, for general health. But it's, it's also possible to go too far with it on the other side and be malnourished and, um, you know, lose, lose performance um, because you're not fueling enough. Yeah, and I when I tried to lose weight in the past, when I like cut back on calories and I weigh myself and I'm like, oh, yay, I'm 140 pounds and I'm only five more pounds to my goal weight. And that five pounds is a lot, actually, to lose, and at least for me. And it, it, begin, it, it turns into not only are you losing fat, but now you're also losing muscle mass. And yeah, it's a delicate balance between the two of them. And, and I'm still learning from that. 
so why don't we dive into um, just the whole process of that you've experienced so far working with a nutritionist. I know that it, I think it started off where you had to do some education material to, it's not like they just told you, okay, this is what you need to eat. Uh, you know, this, I'm going to give you a diet plan and you know, this is exactly what you need to eat. It's, it's more of that. They wanted you to educate yourself on, uh, on what's healthy and, and why, um, why you should focus on certain foods? So the program is through Jen Giles and her company is called Eat for Sport. So eat number four sport.com and I'll link that in the description. And yes, basically it is an, an ed educational course. That's what you're really paying for. And you have a nutritionist who works with you and I get to... Uh, talk to her once a week, kind of give an update on um, some of the things. And there's different topics that she covers each week. Uh, last week it was, um, I believe it was calcium intake to see if I was taking enough calcium and protein. Um, and then this week on Monday when I meet with her, I'm going to share with her uh, what I've logged in the My Fitness Pal app. And so each week we do talk and we discuss um, some of the things that I have questions with and also the course material. And so I completed the course material, which has six modules, and it is very informative. I think at first I didn't know what to expect working with a nutritionist because I've never worked with one before. And so I didn't really know, I was kind of approaching it blindly. And so when I learned that it's a course material, I thought, okay, so, I mean, I guess it's kind of like you play a video and you learn something. At first I thought, nah, that's really not effective, but it actually turned out to be really informative. Uh, and I learned a lot in even the first lesson of how to regulate blood sugar and in this lesson she, she talks about and she brings up this graph on the x-axis there's time of day and the y-axis has blood sugar levels now for those of you who probably watch videos of how blood sugar levels rise and fall throughout the day you probably have seen a similar graph to that where you wake up in the morning, your blood sugar is low, so you eat breakfast, and then your blood sugar spikes, and then your blood sugar drops again sometime throughout the day, and you get tired and sleepy, and you eat something, and then it shoots up, and then you get tired and sleepy in the middle of the day, and you get a snack, and your blood sugar shoots up again. So it's like a wave. And I've always known that there's, you know, that's what your blood sugar is doing, but I never really knew how to to what the next step is like okay so that's what your blood sugar level is doing so now what like what do I do to regulate it and she showed a an interesting graph of how blood sugar levels should be and how women should be eating every three hours and it should be small meals whereas men should be eating every four hours now I don't count like in the breakfast for breakfast, I don't say, okay, now it's 630. I'm done with my breakfast. And at 930, I'll be ready to eat something. Like I don't actually look, I used to actually look at the clock and I, I actually had a timer on my, on my phone set for three hours. So I knew, okay, now it's time to, to eat something. But now it's almost like out of habit, my body just knows, okay, it's time to eat a snack. Uh, and, or, you know, it's time to eat lunch. And so a lot of it has to do with the frequency of your eating, but the, your, the amount that you're eating should be smaller because you're eating a lot more, you're eating more often throughout the day. Uh, I think I sort of on the, the topic of, you know, comparing the, 
the feeding frequency to men and women and how you just mentioned that uh, women should eat slightly more frequent meals than men. Um, I think I heard somewhere in the past that intermittent fasting works better for men than women. It, did they mention that at all in this uh, program? No, although I've seen new studies showing that intermittent, intermittent fasting is actually no longer... Uh, we, different studies saying that intermittent fasting is actually detrimental to people's health. Like it actually, it was linked to heart disease, I believe, because they had done studies with um, different cultures that did intermittent fasting. And they showed that they had more susceptible, they were more susceptible to heart disease. So I don't know if the entire masses are still for uh, for intermittent fasting, and uh, but she doesn't mention that okay. at all. Um, yeah, I would have thought that. Um, and I have no proof of this, but I would have thought that I wouldn't have guessed heart disease, but I would have thought that maybe intermittent fasting could affect hormones like you know, testosterone or, you know, if you, if you're fasted for too long of a time, it might, it might af detrimentally affect your testosterone because you, it puts, it, it'll increase your cortisol because your body thinks it's starving. Yeah. I mean, it could be, it could, that could be true. Um, I will find the study and I'll link it in the description if anyone's interested in, in reading that study, but I can't recall exactly what article I, I read that from. Okay. So what I was doing wrong in the past, and I mentioned about, I used to eat, I mean, I still do eat well, um, but I don't, I don't really focus on, um, like I need to have vegetables, you know, like that, I think that's, I have to, I actually have ingrained it in my, in my daily routine that I have the spinach, I have broccoli, um, my two sources, my two vegetables of choice, because I mean, there are other vegetables that I do like to eat, but I just find them, the two of them being the easiest to, to consume for me. But a couple of years ago, I would have, you know, I would have sweet potatoes, roasted sweet potatoes for lunch with roasted vegetables like cauliflower, um, ve uh, broccoli, um, green beans and some sort of protein source like maybe chicken or something. And that is a really good lunch. But after that, after lunch, I would feel really sleepy. Like I, it was time for me to take a nap. Like I would sit there at my desk at work and I, I'm about to fall asleep. And I couldn't figure that out because I thought I'm eating well. Like, why am I really feeling really, really uh, tired? And I think it's because I waited too long to eat in between meals. So my breakfast would be early in the morning. I get up 3.30 ish in the morning, you know, to take the dogs out, do my stretches and, and um, get ready for the day. And I'm at work by 6.30 in the morning. And so my breakfast, I eat breakfast around probably five o'clock. And lunch would be around 11 or 12. So it's a long time to, to not eat anything already. So that is what, five hours? So you, you ate breakfast at five? Five, then, five thirty. I can't. Yeah. And then you didn't eat again until uh, at least. Like a, a lot. Yeah. 11, 12, sometimes 1230. So that's, that's like at least six hours. Yeah. So it's a long yeah. time in between meals. And so that's where that whole graph where it's showing you know the blood sugar spike and then you're dipping and the reason why you're doing that is because or the reason why it was happening with me was because i wasn't getting anything in between that which i should have and so with my line of work it's it's hard because i'm a science teacher and i always preach to the to kids that you can't eat in a science classroom. There's no eating in a science classroom because we do experiments. And I want to be able to model that behavior 
in front of them. But it's almost like now what do I do if it's, let's say, eight o'clock and I'm eating a snack and they see me eating a snack in front of them. And so they'll do the same thing. So it's it's it was a struggle. And now that school's starting, I'm it's going to be interesting to see how I'll be able to manage that uh, somehow be able to uh, manage my frequency of eating in between meals. So yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think ideally it would be every three to four hours that you should be eating so that you don't feel that, you know, drop in blood sugar levels. Yeah. And I think that's one reason that, that a lot of people probably have a, a hard time eating on that shorter frequency or, or consistent frequency is because the convenience yeah right? because of the convenience it's not convenient to do it right um, like and, now it's the it's still summer i mean school's gonna start in a few days but yeah in the summertime uh, it's easier for me because you know if i'm doing something around the house or outside it's like okay i feel a little hungry let me get something to eat for a snack and so i'll i can just walk into the refrigerator and grab something whereas it'll be a little bit more challenging to do that when um you know when I start going back in. Yeah, and and even for me, I, I I have a desk job, which makes it a lot easier to eat frequently than uh, what Joy does. Um, but even for me, uh, depending on the day, sometimes I'll I'll have a few meetings lined up in the later morning, which is so. Let's say if I was trying to eat every three or four hours. Um, you know, I'll have, I'll have breakfast before I start work, but then it's like, I need to have a snack in the late morning. And sometimes I'll have meetings scheduled for that time. So I can't really, you know, stop and, and take, you know, stop and have a snack. Or if I'm in the office and, um, sometimes I just feel weird if I'm in the office and people see me eating like every three hours, they're going to be like, what's wrong with this guy? He's always eating. Does he ever work? Yeah. Jason's really good with, with his, you're just, I find that you're really good at, at keeping up with your diet and nutrition better than I am. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, in my case, to be honest, it's, um, it's kind of part of my personality. Uh, that's, I'm very regimented and I'm like borderline OCD with, with routines and stuff. So for me, it's kind of, it feels normal to, you know, to follow a really structured, uh, eating routine, but it, I, I know it may not come naturally for a lot of people. So another thing that I learned is how to read nutritional labels. And I used to, you know, just glance at the nutritional labels, but I don't really go into t details with the ingredients in them because most of them, it's like the number one rule is if you don't recognize any of the ingredients, then you should probably avoid it. So that's pretty much um, what I learned uh, in the past before I did, you know, this course is just avoid anything that has these, um, unrecognizable words that might, or the, the ingredients that might be, you know, artificially, I guess, artificial ingredients in them. And so going into a little bit more in depth with that, um, with nutritional labels and the ingredients, I learned now that there are some ingredients to avoid, which there's a list of them. And now I can look at a nutrition label. And if I see that, it's like, oh, okay, I should avoid that. And list includes hydrogenated oils. This is a very common one, high fructose, high fructose corn syrup, sugar alcohols like erythritol, xylitol, stevia, and other artificial artificial sweeteners. And the reason for that 
is because it could upset your stomach and you can have gut issues. With high fructose corn syrup, there's, you know, it's found in sodas. I don't, although I don't drink soda anymore, so it's been a while. It's been years since I drank soda, so I don't really know if they change the, uh, what the type of sweetener they use, but there are a number of um, snacks out there that are, that have high fructose corn syrup. I also learned that ketchup has it too, right? The, the regular ketchup. Yeah. Depending on the brand. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's like condiments is something where you really, it's a good idea to read the nutrition label no matter what. Um, but condiments I think are an area where, you know, certain brands tend to sneak in, uh, ingredients that, um, you know, you wouldn't expect to be in that product. So, um, I think in general, anytime that you're buying something that, that you know, is a, some, something that's processed to some degree, and it's not just a simple one and in, one ingredient of food. Um, anytime you know that there's multiple ingredients in that food, it's probably a good idea to read the label and just make sure you're comfortable with everything that's in there. Cause sometimes stuff sneaks in there that, you know, you're, you wouldn't expect. Yeah. There's preservatives, especially if you are, you know, eating some processed foods and there are, we get our, um, part of our groceries we get from Costco and there are some easy meals, you know, to, that they have that are either frozen um, or packaged. And I'm always in, you know, the, the, they always have these very uh, eye-catching images in front of their, uh, the pictures that they have on in front of the packaging. It's like, oh, wow, this is, looks really good. And I'm now getting in the habit of looking at the ingredients and seeing, you know, just looking through the list of ingredients I, and I see, okay, it has, I don't remember how to, I can't pronounce it, guar gum or something or xanthan gum. Yeah. Um, so that's when I know just to avoid, avoid that. And uh, so it's easy for me now. I shouldn't say easy, but it's a little easier for me to now look at a nutritional label and have a little bit more confidence that I am purchasing something that is good for my body. And I've had since, since this whole experience with working with a nutritionist, I um, have had actually, I've had some fun with, you know, baking or cooking my own, making my own things, snacks that uh, I have around the house. And my parents for my birthday got me a bread machine. And it's been fun making my own bread and, you know, using whole wheat flour, adding chia seeds, adding pumpkin seeds. So I know that I'm the one who made it. And I know exactly what sort of stuff or ingredients that I added to that. And same thing with, I found this recipe wow. called, I found a recipe for healthy granola. And so I followed the recipe and I added chia seeds, pumpkin seeds, pecans, um, almonds, and it's delicious. The granola can also be in as a, as cereal. And I love it. I, it makes me, it makes me feel good. And I feel like having gone through this, it's, I feel like I am eating low caloric dense foods, but they are high in vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients that are good for my body. And funny enough is that I'm actually, I actually feel fuller uh, for a lot longer and which makes me in turn not eat as much. And I know this because 
when we have like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we kind of go a little easy with our, uh, with what we're eating because we're pretty regimented throughout the week and we'll have sushi on Friday nights. And sometimes, you know, most of the time I'll actually order two sushi. So I'll have like a salmon nigiri and then something else. And I used to be able to finish two orders of sushi. So that's salmon nigiri and whatever other thing it is. So how many, you know how many pieces there are? I'm gonna... uh, it's like the nigiri one is like eight pieces. Eight pieces. And then what about if there's a Sam special? Salmon avocado roll, I think is 12 pieces. Okay. So yeah, I used to be able to eat all of that. But now, <laughs> and now I just have Jason finish the rest because I'll, I'll have my salmon nigiri, the eight pieces of salmon nigiri, and then I'll have like four pieces of whatever other salmon avocado roll that I have. And <laughs> I just look at Jason and he's like, I can't finish. I can't finish it all. And so he'll eat the rest of it. But yeah, I, it's, um, it's amazing how like the difference in in just what you're eating and the quality of ingredients that you're taking in makes a huge difference in how you feel and also how much you eat. Yeah, and just before I forget, um, you know, talking about in healthy ingredients and or unhealthy ingredients and with there's certain processed foods that uh are labeled organic and you know, so it sounds healthy to anything that's labeled organic kind of sounds healthier but sometimes if you actually read the label it'll everything is technically organic but it'll say you know organic xanthan gum or organic this and that and it's like okay is that really healthy or uh, is you know it's just um you know marketed as being healthy if you can if you have the means to get an app like my fitness pal i have a i, th I think i have an annual member subscription to it it really breaks down the macros, which are carbs, proteins, and fats, and also something with fiber, if anything has fiber. And that was another thing that in this, in the course that I learned is adding fiber will actually help break down those carbs, proteins, and fats a lot slower. So that's why you're not so that's why that's why you don't have to eat as much is because those foods are still getting broken down in your body and t being taken in and absorbed and so that's really where i've been you know i think pretty decent pretty good at adding fiber to my diet a lot more um and yeah yeah you're getting creative about sneaking sneaking uh these fiber sources or just nutrient sources into your you know into your meals yeah and my the recovery shake i used to spend well I, unfortunately I, I bought two uh, two canisters of it um i get my recovery shake from uh first endurance and it's ultra gen and I'm trying to move away from that. I'm using up all my, the, the canisters that I have left. And I'm slowly moving away from using that because first off, it is pretty costly. But I've learned that chocolate milk is actually a, you know, a pretty good source of, a good recovery source, a rec recovery drink source. And um, I can't, I wrote it down. Um, how it has like the same amount of BCAAs and um, I can't remember what other um, similarities or maybe even better compared to a, a typical recovery shake that you would get, that you would take. So for my recovery shake, I have the chocolate milk 
added to it's in a it's all in a Nutribullet. I add a little bit of of coffee, my black coffee, whatever I have left over. Um, a cup of frozen blueberries, spinach, and I used to add yogurt to it, but it's the consistency. It changes the consistency and yogurt. I, I eat yogurt on the side, but I don't really add it to my shake anymore because of the consistency and the, and the taste. Um, so I add chia seeds to it. And did I say spinach? I think you did. Yeah. yeah. And spinach is a lot of calcium. So I add, I really stuff the Nutribullet with spinach. Yeah. And I just uh, use a Nutribullet, mix it all up and I get a good recovery shake. And I haven't really felt any different compared to using Ultragen as a recovery drink. I mean, Ultragen is more calories. I think it does have a little bit more protein, but honestly, I have not felt anything any different in terms of my performance on the bike. Yeah, so I think one thing to take away from what we just talked about is it's always good to look for natural ingredients and the um it's not necessarily that you know you have to eat all f foods that have very few ingredients i mean there can be some quote processed foods that have you know multiple ingredients that could still be healthy but um you're probably not going to go wrong if you try to focus most of your diet especially off the bike or you know outside of your exercise window when you're just eating regular meals you're probably not going to go wrong if you're eating simple one ingredient foods um, obviously if you're having a meal that's several different things it's more than one ingredient but what I mean is um, you know a uh, a potato, you know, you know what that is. It's a, you know, one, th it's one thing, a potato, you know, a, a piece of fruit, um, you know, chicken, rice, veggies, um, you know, wh whether you're talking protein, carbs, or fats, if the, the mixture of protein, carbs, and fats, that's ideal for someone is going to vary depending on you know, your activity level and, and everything. But, um, if you get those sources from natural foods that only have that one ingredient, that's probably the, the most healthy way to go. Um, and I still believe that uh, I, several years ago before, before we started cycling, I was really into the paleo diet and, uh, you know, I don't, I kind of hesitate to promote like one particular diet, but I always thought of all the diets out there that paleo made the most sense to me because it wasn't, it wasn't too restrictive in terms of macronutrients. You know, it's, it's not saying like you can't eat any carbs, but it's just saying, your your macronutrient sources should come from from natural foods um you know things that that grow out in the wild you know for example um and i was kind of into that for a few years and i've backed off of it um a little bit since we started riding just because it's not the most out of convenience, really. I mean, it's not the most convenient thing to, you know, be riding along and, you know, trying to eat a sweet potato while you're riding your bike. So it's like sometimes you have to resort to things that are a little more processed. But I still, I still believe that that type of diet is, is healthy. Um, a diet that's based on whole foods and minimal ingredients and processing. So I still try to get most of my off the bike meals from, uh, you know, following that type of a, a rule where I just try to focus on the, the whole natural foods. 
which is there's a difference and I think sometimes people get confused of the terms nutrition and fueling and I think a lot of people think that what they're using to fuel their workouts is what they should also be using outside of that. And I think there's a big difference. You know, nutrition is what you're eating off the bike and fueling is what you're eating on the bike. Yeah, and there's and there's also a difference between you know, fueling for performance and, um, you know, nutrition for, for general health, you know, sometimes, um, you have to separate the two a little bit because what, what helps you perform while you're riding or whatever, whatever sport you're doing may not be the healthiest thing for you to, to eat when you're off the bike. Um, but you know, if, when, uh, when the engine is running, you know, you can get away with a little bit more, um, you have a little bit more flexibility, I think in, you know, what your body can, can process. Right. Like you shouldn't be eating gels off the bike or you shouldn't be drinking, scratch high carb mix when you're sitting down behind a desk to carb load it I mean you could but um yeah just keep that on the bike as opposed to off the bike yeah and you probably don't want to like carb load every single day just so that you can smash every workout that you do you know it's yeah, especially when you're doing just an endurance ride and when we do Usually throughout the week, in the, in the, on the weekdays, we do like an hour endurance rides and then we get, we do a longer one on the weekends. And so if it's just an hour, I just, dr I just drink, um, a, a drink mix, which has sodium, which has electrolytes in it and a little bit of carbs. And that's pretty much it. I don't eat anything. Whereas if it's more than an hour, if it's an endurance ride, I usually have the Nature's Bakery like fig bars. They're so good. And uh, I, it's, that's really easy to eat. Um, it's not too chewy. The texture is just right where I don't feel like I'm like gagging uh, while I'm riding. And uh, yeah, that's worked for me for several months now. Yeah, good call on the Nature's Bakery bars. I I'm starting to really um, lean on those for endurance rides, and uh, I I realized on the last couple of rides that we did together, um, when especially if I happen to be the one riding in the front when it's time for me to to eat, I, I've I've realized that I can actually shove a whole one of those bars in my mouth and at the, at, at the, uh, you know, with, without taking multiple bites and it's just, just shove it in there and just, chew, you know, let it, let it dissolve while I'm, uh, uh, while I'm riding. Yeah. And even if you're not chewing, it'll dissolve in your mouth and you can just easily swallow it. Um, yeah, I love that stuff. So I guess maybe we should work, we should move into fueling, right? We have the nutrition that's off the bike. And if you guys have any questions about this, there's obviously more to it in nutrition than what we've talked about. Um, well, just one last point before, because I don't think we covered this 100% uh, on the nutrition uh, before we get into the fueling side. Um, in regards to macronutrients and having carbs, proteins, fats, and fiber, um, what did the nutritionist say to you about, um, anything about percentages of like how much of your plate should be from each macronutrient? Does that, 
does that vary depending on, you know, your sport or activity level and so forth? So she said four to one carb to protein ratio. So you should have like good, healthy carbs, uh, not like bread, carbs, you know, like you, unless it's whole wheat, but it should be a, a four to one car, uh, carb to protein ratio carbs as in, uh, fruits and vegetables have carbs, um, health, grains, right? Mm-hmm. Healthy rice. grains, rice, brown rice. I like white rice. Um, so that is the you know the the key and you know have some fats in there and obviously fiber just to slow down the digestion and i think that goes for that's just speaking for an athlete right an endurance athlete right like it could be different for um you know, f- for an average right. person. So actually in the very beginning of the course, she talks about what she calls it an easy plate, a medium plate, and a hard plate. And there's a great um, breakdown of each plate and how what your easy plate should look like. This is when you're, it's a recovery day. You're not, you know, you're just doing an easy spin or you're not you know, you're not riding or running or whatever it is that you're doing for activities. And the medium plate is when you have a little slightly harder workout, you know, not too hard, not too long. And then the hard plate I would consider would be like what we did, we've done in the past, which is like a three hour hard ride on the hills. And, um, you know, that means that we're going a little harder on hills around here not zone two or not endurance pace so or and then hard plate could also hard plate could be also like races like after a race uh especially depending on how long the race is how much of that would be carbs protein fats ratio Mm -hmm. okay and so with with that we can jump into the fueling fueling i i can get started first yeah go ahead so i have um i have determined that every 45 minutes is my sweet spot when it comes to fueling on the bike so that means when we're doing endurance rides if it's a four-hour endurance ride, I'll bl- I'll bring three to four of the Nature's Bakery fig bars, and that ha- that formula has worked for me. It might not work for everyone, but on top of that, I also have a water bottle, a 950 milliliter water bottle, which has four scoops of the Scratch High Carb Mix which is roughly around 200 calories, like Mm. a little over 200 calories. So that is, I found that to be a good formula because I have not had any gut issues. I have not bonked. And there are times when like halfway to the ride, I feel like my body is just tired and that's you know for obvious reasons because I mean I've been riding for a couple hours but other than that like I usually have a good decent ride using that formula again it might not work for everyone oh and sorry I don't do just one bottle of 950 milliliters of water and high carb mix I depending on where we stop or how much I finish that bottle, then I'll have a second bottle with another uh, four scoops of the high carb mix that I take with me in a small Ziploc bag. uh, And I try to finish that. So I probably, it depends on like the the four hour endurance ride that we did, I think I had about 700 calories and I burned over a thousand calories on that so it was you know it was perfect it was ideal 
yeah, uh, for me, what's worked pretty well is actually a couple of the same things that Joy just mentioned. The one product that I have come to like is the the scratch high carb mix. Supposedly, it's it consists of a the carbohydrate sources. They call it cluster dextrin, but supposedly it's something that digests slowly, slower than, you know, pure sugar. Um, and so I've had pretty good success with that. Uh, it seems to provide a you know, fairly sustained energy uh, throughout the course of a ride. And so I'll, on an endurance ride, I'll have some of that scratch high carb mix. I usually go with the full serving, which is 400 calories in, in a big bottle. Um, which is seven scoops, right? Yeah. Seven scoops. Um, and I'll put that in a big bottle of water, like the 950 milliliter bottle. Um, so I'm actually probably, it, it takes me probably an hour and a half, two hours to, to actually drink all that. Um, but I'm also, so I'm taking in those liquid calories, but I'm also eating some of those nature's bakery bars, um, for some, some solid food. And I try to, to do those every 45 minutes, like, like joy. Um, sometimes it doesn't work, uh, exactly at that interval, but, um, yeah, I, I've been, on the endurance rides, I've been going mainly with the, the Nature's Bakery bars for solid food and the Scratch High Carb Mix to kind of fill in the gap um, with the calories and carbs so that I don't have to have a ton of solid food in my stomach um, throughout the ride. And But I'm still getting making sure that I get in the calories that I need a general rule that's this has worked well for me it may differ for other people but i find that at a minimum i try to to take in half the number of calories that um that i'm going to burn as you know kilojoules and i've become pretty good at estimating how many kjs i'm going to burn for a given ride so i know roughly um you know one hour of zone two riding is something like 550 to 600 kjs for me um on a a ride that has some intervals or you know just like a harder a harder ride will be more like seven to 800 kjs depending on you know how much intensity there is and how long how long those efforts are like a race effort would be more like uh, more like 800 sometimes even 900 um on the the very hardest efforts that i've done have probably been you know 900 kjs an hour but you know, I try to estimate going into the ride what I expect to be burning, and that way I can uh, pack my fuel sources accordingly and make sure I have enough, and um, you know, plan plan for the amount of calories roughly that I need um, per hour. So again, I at a minimum, I I try to take in um, basically the the number of kjs that I plan on burning for that ride. Uh, divide that in half and that's how many calories that I need at minimum for the course of the ride and you know you sort of divide that into how many hours the ride is um, so what it ends up what ends up happening obviously is on intensity days I'm taking in more than than endurance rides and if we're doing a workout or uh, a hard ride that's two hours or less, uh, or a race, I pretty much go all liquid calories. And the only difference, so, um, the main difference between 
that and an endurance ride is that I'm still taking the the, the scratch high carb mix, but rather than eating nature's bakery bars, I'll have a, a flask of maple syrup where I take shots of that once in a while. Um, so it's, it's a combination of the maple syrup and the, the scratch high carb, uh, on intensity days to, to have all liquid calories because that, that sits better in my stomach, um, when I'm going hard. Um, however, if, if it's an intense ride, that's like three or four hours, um, that a three or four hour ride where there is some intensity, like for example, the tour Litchfield Hills that we did, um, a couple weeks ago, it wasn't, we weren't going full gas that whole time, but you know, it was a four, uh, it was like a four and a half hour ride with some intense efforts thrown in. So that's kind of a hybrid where I did take in some solid food because, you know, after, after four hours of, of riding, if I try to do that on all liquid, especially if I'm not, you know, there'll be periods of the ride where I'm going easy. I'll start feeling hungry if I don't have something more solid in my stomach. So on that type of a ride, I'll do kind of a combination and I'll, I'll have like one or two um, nature's bakery bars just to, to put something in my stomach and then, um, but the rest of it will come from liquid. Yeah. Um, the intense ri rides with intensity, uh, the fueling is a little different also with me. Um, and I use gels, gels have worked with me. So if it's like a, a workout, let's say lasting two hours, um, I'll do like a gel before the start of the workout or before the warm up. You know, I'll let the, I'll take a gel, and then, depending, you know, I'll look to see. I'll do the workout, but I'll look to see when 45 minutes hit, and then that's when I take another gel, uh, and that's worked out for me. And I think it's it's good to practice that um, during intensity days because when you're actually racing, you know, you wanna make sure that your stomach can handle it. And I still keep the uh, four scoops, which is a little over 200 calories of the scratch high carb mix. And I've sort of like been going back and forth. I've done five scoops, I've done six. And at some point it doesn't agree in my with my stomach when I go over five. Um, so I'm still experimenting on that and I'm also still experimenting on caffeine and how much caffeine to take. Uh, I don't usually take a ca caffeine on the workouts, but I will add a little bit of the scratch caffeine in my bottle during events and or races, but the scratch caffeine mix that they have has a scoop like has already has a scoop in it and they say one scoop in a 16 ounce bottle and I actually use half a scoop because I don't want too much caffeine and there's a I think there's a sweet spot to the amount of caffeine at least for me there's a sweet spot to the amount of caffeine that I can handle because if I think at tour of Litchfield Hills I added a little bit more than half a scoop to my drink mix and I felt like at some point I didn't feel like my heart was racing I felt as though my stomach had a hard time digesting yeah I think it's also possible that caffeine uh I'm not totally sure about this but it's another thing that I I think I might have read in the past don't quote me on this but um I can look it up. Yeah, it's also possible that caffeine suppresses your appetite. So um, it may make it, you know, that's where you get the stomach issues because you don't really feel hungry, but you're still, you know, taking in the calories anyway. 
Yeah, it says here that this is through the National Institute of Health and the conclusions are the results suggest caffeine has weak transient effects on energy intake <clears throat> and do not support caffeine as an effective appetite suppressant. No. So okay, so I, I mean, so it could. probably not. I, my a, the issue with me is not that it suppresses my appetite. It's more of I feel like whatever I'm taking in is like sitting in my stomach and it's not leaving. Mm-hmm. And then I'm just taking gels and I could be taking, you know, I, I had a little bit at Tor Litchfield. I had the uh, scratch bar that they had at the one of the aid stations. I had half of that and I felt like it's really not going anywhere. I felt kind of heavy, but it could be because we're also the combination of going pretty hard on that one climb and the caffeine in my, in my system, I think just a combination of that. I'm still trying to to figure out, you know, what the appropriate amount is for me. Yeah, well, just from anecdotal experience, I'm pretty sure that doing a hard effort suppresses your appetite because, uh, you know, you're just not, it's like your body just isn't, um, isn't focused on, digesting food because it's like sending its resources for other things Um, i think it did the opposite for me doing a hard workout doesn't suppress my appetite in in fact it made me (laughs) throw up oh just from the i'm I'm thinking of the workout that we did a couple of weeks ago well i would say that does that is kind of a suppressing your appetite because it's like if it's your stomach is like saying, oh, I don't want anything in here. And and then, you know, you're probably still like the, you have stuff in your stomach because you're taking in. Right. Calories. It's probably like using your blood is probably like or your body's probably like, well, your blood needs to go to your legs. Yeah. And not so in your stomach. It affects your digestion, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Last point on this that I want to make is if you can find something that works well for you, you know, maybe, maybe stick to that and, um, not, especially if you're racing or doing events that, you know, where you really, uh, are concerned about your performance and not having any, you know, hiccups that could, uh, interfere with that. Um, you know, we found some things that tend to work well for us and we just kind of stick to them. And it may sound boring that we eat, uh, pretty much the same thing, have the, the same fuel sources on almost every ride that we do. Um, but it, in the past, you know, several years ago, I would be much more varied in what I was eating. I, I used to eat all kinds of stuff um when we first started riding i would you know take like various goodies and you know be eating like brownies cookies you know this and that yeah Um, i remembered i had like snickers because i love snickers so i had one of those finger size snicker bars that's not a good idea it totally messed with my stomach yeah one time we like stopped for ice cream like (laughs) in the middle of a ride and then that didn't go well after i was like very sluggish after that um, because there are people who, you know, I don't want to say, I don't know if they're influencers, but they, there's people who take pictures of what they eat, right? And you think, oh, that's what I'm supposed to be eating too when I'm riding. But it's not always, you know, it obviously you'd, you'd have to go with what your body can handle, but it's not for everyone. You know, I, I've been, I realized that what pros eat during their rides is not for me. Like I, I think I, I follow Matteo Jorgensen on Instagram and he posted a, a picture of one of the um, pastries that he had and it's a massive pastry and it was like on a plate. Like, I don't think I can eat that whole thing. Well, also f- for some context, he probably didn't eat that in the middle of his ride. It was probably like after he probably ended 
he was probably doing like a you know point to point ride where it's it was like a long you know like a, he was probably riding for like four or five hours and ended up at a coffee shop at the end and you know got this you know uh massive pastry to you know as a post ride meal which you know that's fine like i would still do that um well i was just thinking like i it's funny because i was i was thinking like i was looking at that picture and like i don't think i can eat that in the middle of my ride but i can definitely eat it now while i'm sitting here <laughs> Yeah. Not doing anything. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, as far as during the ride, once you find something that works well for you, that, that fuels you, uh, keeps you energized, and does not upset your stomach, um, just stick to that. Yeah, and I think it's imp- the reason why we're talking about this on the podcast is – I think a lot of people think they know how to fuel, and I'm not saying that we know how to fuel, but there's definitely a a way to optimize your fueling strategy while you're on a bike. And I was just, we were just listening to our favorite podcast, the Bonk Bros podcast today. And at the very end, I think Scott said he asked one of his sports directors like what they ate when they (laughs) used to race and he goes he ate one granny smith (laughs) for like a seven hour ride or something or a six or seven hour ride so i think the it's it has come a long way all the research that goes into endurance exercises uh, and or endurance athletes it's important to fuel as often because another thing is you know when I'm fueling great and I don't do it a hundred percent all the time like there are times when I I miss the 45 minute window or somehow I didn't bring enough food but when I'm on top of it I get home and I'm not starving like I'm not looking and eating everything that's in our refrigerator. And I think that is a key takeaway to be able to fuel properly on your rides is that you're not coming home and you're starving. You know, that's not what you want. You want to make sure that you are just right. When you get home, you have your recovery shake and you do stretches and everything and then have a meal. Yeah. Sometimes when I used to under fuel on a ride, um, you know, particularly a long ride, if I underfueled and I come, come home hungry, you know, I end up eating like a snake and like I eat so much that it's like, then I'm like stuffed for, uh, you know, I have such a big dinner that like, I'm, you know, then I'm stuffed and then it affects my sleep and, you know, it's like a chain reaction. So. Right. Yeah. we used to joke that Jason has a fourth stomach or he has a, a tapeworm <laughs> that he feeds that's um pretty much it right for yeah, nutrition so. and fueling um i do want to quickly just mention from last week's episode just a few corrections or things that we want to add uh we discussed how remco won the olympic road race and he got a puncture in the last 3k of the of the race and i questioned why he wasn't using you know why he wasn't running tubeless and it's primarily because he specialized or that the team is sponsored by specialized and i i guess they don't have a sponsor they don't they can't use another product or some other product that they're not sponsored by so they have to use specialized products and because of that they are running um specialized tires uh specifically i pulled up the article for this this is from cycling weekly the he uses the turbo cotton race tires which are not tubeless and they do have a tubeless version of that and specialize i know also makes inner tubes and so that's why they the team runs inner tubes as opposed to tubeless because they don't have a separate sponsor for tubeless so anyway, that's why 
he ran tubeless or he ran inner tubes. And then another thing that I found out was we talked about how Rich Froning last year did the Leadville 100 and he got the whole, uh, you know, he finished it in under nine hours and got the big belt buckle. And Rich Froning is the fittest man on earth. He's a CrossFit, retired CrossFit athlete. He actually did it this year. And he finished in eight hours and 45 minutes with an average speed of almost 12 miles per hour. The guy is an absolute monster. Yeah, he's a beast. I don't, I don't think that there's like anything that that dude is bad at when it comes to athletics. I seriously thought he was going to like just go for a joy ride the second time around, but I guess he was still going for that belt buckle. Oh boy. Loud thunder outside. We got a notification on our phone saying that there's a flood warning. It's really he raining heavy here. So um, that's... Oh, wait, did you want to add anything to that? Rudy. Shh. Rudy. It's okay. It's okay, buddy. Rudy. Um, did you want to talk about the the hot takes yeah yeah i don't it's i guess we can maybe quickly I don't, yeah. it doesn't really no big deal um so women's tour de france is actually today's the last day they do alpe d'huez today so eight stages yeah i'm i'm uh right after we uh get done with with this i'm gonna be uh turning that on if it's if i already it's... looked it up because i wanted to know who won but oh, I'm not going to say don't it. Don't tell me. Yeah, I, I really want. I want to watch like this whole stage because I've been looking forward to this this stage. I, for some reason, I thought that the men's Tour de France was going to do Alpe d'Huez this year, and then they didn't. Um, and but the women are doing it, and I'm looking forward to this mountain stage. Um, so yeah, I want to watch that later. Yeah, I guess real quick, stage one and two was won by Charlotte Cool or Cole, I think that's how you pronounce it. And she, I guess, was suffering from a mystery illness uh, a few months ago and really hard had a hard time uh, with her breathing. I did have the article up, but now I can't find it. So um, just as a source, but now it's kind of, imp it's pretty impressive that she won the first two stages. I think the first stage she and Lorena Weebus were sprinting for the win and Weebus may have had a mechanical because it looked like she started spinning really, really fast while she was seated. So I, so, and then she didn't accelerate. So maybe there was a mechanical, I'm not sure about that, but yeah, so she won the first two stages um, and then the kind of the mo most talked about stage was probably stage five when Demi Vollering, who was in the yellow, crashed out and her teammates left her behind. Uh, that was outside of the 3K rule where if you crash out within the 3K mark um 3k distance you can still you still have the the time the same time as everybody else who finished so she lost a lot of time from that what do you what's your opinion on that um i mean i to me that that team the st works team seems pretty dysfunctional this, this isn't isn't the first time that there's been the appearance of you know, teammates not helping each other or kind of, um, it's almost, it almost seems like they compete against each other sometimes. Um, yeah, they seem to have a habit of doing that. And they also have a habit. Some of them have a, ha have a habit of celebrating too early and then losing a sprint because they celebrated too early. <laughs> yeah. Unlike, unlike Kristen Faulkner, who, um, uh, who smashes it all the way through the finish line with no celebration and guarantees that she wins. Yeah, there was a lot of talk about there's a speculation that it was Lorena Weebus who um I it, 
I'm sure it wasn't intentional. I hope it wasn't intentional that she bumped her handlebars with Demi Vollering and caused her to crash out. Uh, and there were reports who quote Lorena Weebus saying she thought she saw a yellow, like a fleeting, like in a fleet of the moment, like she saw something yellow go down and she just kept riding. And, uh, and so, yeah, that was kind of, I don't know. I'm not sure road racing is, I thought that the men's road racing had a little bit of drama. Now I feel like the women also have a bit of drama. And I thought it was surprising um, that one of the domestiques, Demi Vollering's domestiques, uh, she was quoted saying that it's not that bad losing the yellow jersey. And I thought I was like, I was kind of surprised that she said that it was her domestic Bredewald said something along the lines of she it's not that bad to lose the yellow jersey because she you know she got it kind of early and we don't know if she can hold that jersey for until the end so I thought that that was strange to to say because you would think if you are the sponsor of a team you want your you want your team to be in the yellow jersey for as long as you can. And even if you lose the yellow jersey, you don't... I would think you wouldn't want to necessarily lose a minute and a half off of the, the GC. It's like it's one thing to lose the yellow jersey and be, you know, 10 seconds back, but, you know, to lose a, a minute and a half or whatever um, whatever was lost there. Yeah, I, I you it, could... It's a lot to come back from. Yeah, I guess you could say it's one thing to lose the yellow jersey, but have your teammates tow you back to the, you know, to the to the finish line. But it's another to lose the yellow jersey and have your teammates leave you behind. Yeah. So that's pretty much it. That's our opinion. <laughs> um, anything else? Um, I don't think so. You know, with that, uh. I would like to go uh, watch the uh, the final stage now. All right, guys. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Check out the links in the description if you want to learn more about registered dietitian Jen Giles. I've also provided a link to the research surrounding intermittent fasting. Just as a disclaimer, we are citing evidence from one research done, and we recognize that there are conflicting conclusions out there. Please decide what's best for you, and always consult your doctor if you're unsure. As always, don't forget to enjoy your rides.